Here I get a bit more controversial uh, because Paul Comars uh, went to great pains to say that, well, uh, there was no sediment interruption and uh, uh, due to the construction of the, the breakwater, he didn't really discuss the dredge channels. Uh, but I, having uh, had some concerns about what I was reading in terms of things not stacking up, uh, reanalyze the data and I have to say that I don't agree. So two uh, eminent scientists, well I hope there's two eminent scientists, have come up with completely different views on this, this topic. And so my view is that there was a, a gravel supply. I agree with Comar that it wasn't a huge gravel supply but it was significant and significant enough and other researchers who have Done, have modelled things and done investigations that Comar Review also say this, that it was significant enough to now create and post port construction, create a trans or a sediment budget imbalance. Anyway, so Comar said it didn't interrupt the gravel, the gravel wasn't getting around there anyway. What the studies Comar reviewed all said and, um, and uh, Comar agreed with in his review that it did interrupt the sand supply, or at least it deflected it or somehow disturbed it. So this is the sand supply from where? This is the sand supply from where we are here, being driven to the north and around the bluff, and these days around the port, into uh, West Shore and the coastal cell north of the bluff. In respect of both these things, the um, both the gravel and the sand transport. I should point out some of the sand gets transported in the beach because the beach has got a whole mixture of grain sizes, but most of it is actually out in the surf zone or immediately offshore. And there's very little gravel out there. It's mostly sandy. And there's, as we can see out the window, rather um, uh, compelling waves to transport this stuff. So uh, most of it transports out there. What I am proposing is recognizing causes and effects and then finding a solution once those causes are recognised. So, so here I differ from Paul Comar in that he was saying it doesn't cut off the gravel supply. I say it does. Um, and in saying that, I would say, well, therefore, we need to take that into account in finding a solution. Okay. You do not have a problem with storm erosion. If you're there in 1974 and the sea's got so high that it's pouring over the top of the ridge and so on, you might think there's a problem with storms. And if you go there today, uh, you see the top of the, the um, nourishment, the artificial ridge is chopped out and so on. So it looks sort of ugly, depending on your view of the world. There's a huge problem is uh, dredging harbours. So your first coastal erosion problem at West Shore probably was associated with this minor dredging works in this little tidal inlet to get in bigger, bigger vessels, which was a pretty important thing to do back then. Because what happened, you know, the reason you need to dig a hole is because there's too much dirt there. And how did the dirt get there? Well, of course, nature put it there. And so if you dig the hole, what is going to happen quite understandably, and Richard and I even have models that show that this will happen, is the hole fills in again. So it's not the case that you don't have navigation channels. We need navigation channels. But like other coastal management issues, they need to be managed, and that means we need to uh, engage in recurrent dredging. The beach, well, engineers call beaches wave absorbers, and they put them in their wave tanks, precisely that, to absorb the waves so they don't get extraneous reflections and other things that they, they don't want to have. And the idea is if you have waves coming in and they get absorbed by the beach, the transport is dominantly in the shoreward direction. So they deliver up material to the beach. And the beach builds out. Whether the beach builds out or not is simply a function of whether the wave run up is stronger than the backwash. So if you build a big ridge, that particularly during storms, you have the waves crashing into this ridge, and those of you who've been there have probably seen quite strong reflections, not just backwash, but reflections of the waves that 
run back down the beach and you can actually see them propagating back out to sea a short distance. And what that tells you is that you've shifted the bias between onshore transport in the wave run up and offshore transport in the wave run up. So you, despite the fact there isn't significant beach erosion, you certainly haven't done anything to encourage sediment to be on the beach by having such a steep structure um, there. So it would be much nicer if, that, if the structure was modified in some way to, uh, to reduce that effect. If there is a place that the sediment is accumulating, we can see that that's a sink. And if you, create, if you, if you know you're going to dig a hole, well, that's going to be a sink. On the other side of the equation, there are places that are eroding in net terms over time, and that's, the stuff's got to come from somewhere, and that's the source. So for those in the port business, and we must have ports, uh, it's just like beach nourishment. It's, it's an ongoing investment you make in having the port operate because uh, regardless of, of um, where you might think most of the sediment's going to come from, if you've made a sink, it's going to come and it's going to fill in the hole that you've dug, which you will maintain by dredging. What's been happening and what the HB data is showing, and, and Larry pointed, was the first one to point out to me by looking at the um, harbour buoy. No, no, it's not a harbour buoy. It's a, a the freezer work boiler stuck in the beach at West Shore is that the beach has been, not, not the beach itself in particular, but the, the lower beach and subtidal beach is being lowering over time. Where is if you stand on the beach and you look at the boiler or you look at the HB um, uh, data, then the surface through time, let's say at about this point where the boiler might be, this is the intertidal level, but well, it's actually probably further up here, the beach has been going down progressively. You can immediately draw from that, well, what sort of sediments live out here? It's sand. And so you can actually nourish the beach out here with sand that you couldn't keep on the gravel part of the beach. In principle, you could put in a lot of sand and flood, make a sandy beach again. But just another way of providing this sort of coastal protection is to nourish the inshore. So that's completely consistent with general principles. It's completely consistent with my lifetime uh, research and that of the people I work with. And it's completely consistent with the experiment that was run with uh, dump zone R. That, that was Dump zone R was uh, once upon a time the port did some dredging as it always has to do to maintain chipping channels and some of the dredge spoil it put immediately off the beach up near north of West Shore or northern West Shore with an area called the Esplanade. And that we discussed, we talked about that a little uh, a while ago, is that it all looks hunky-dory up there. It may be nothing to do with the, with the dump zone, dump ground R and the sediments that were put there, but I think on the balance of probability, given that it's consistent with what we know with the science, then it was a, a, an experiment that came up with a nice precedent of a way to manage it. What is the nearshore deficit? Uh, and I suppose, in part, that's come out of um, some very brief um, comments that I've made um, in the last few months, that there is a, a nearshore deficit. And as I mentioned earlier, I was uh, alerted to this possibility by Larry Dallimore, who's uh, taken a great interest in it, as many of you may no, it may be that if you did this uh, nearshore nourishment, uh, Larry's dreams would come true and the, the nearshore would be flooded with sand enough to have for a significant, maybe not all the time, but a significant proportion of the typical year, a sandy beach that the citizens of Napier, not to mention the even larger number of tourists who are larger than the citizen, number of citizens in nature, Napier that visit the the place and inject their money into the economy every year would also like to use. I can't believe that something as small scale a problem as what to do with West Shore can't be turned into a large scale opportunity. Despite the fact sea level's been going up there at the predicted rates for global sea level rise that we face in future, it's been doing that uh, for the last 6,000 years in the Netherlands, their beaches and dunes look alike like ours. They've built out 
by the same amount. So it tells you, and the Dutch engineers are applying sand to the coast in the same way, that even though you've got sea level rise, doesn't necessarily mean the beaches are going to disappear. And in fact, they can still keep growing if there is a sand supply. 